Thanks. Thanks very much. And thanks to everyone for coming tonight. Um, needless to say, it's a challenging time to publish a book. But really, any time you're publishing a book is a great time because you're publishing a book. And I'm really happy to share what is the official launch event uh, with everyone who's listening to me right now. Um, I wrote this book to answer a question. Basically, there are two stories you hear about being an artist in the digital age. The Silicon Valley story, which says that there's never been a better time to be an artist because the internet enables you to circumvent the gatekeepers, put your stuff online, and reach an audience. And then there's the story that artists will tell you and that have, they've been telling us since the advent of Napster, certainly musicians have, and then more recently other kinds of artists, writers, visual artists, people who make film and television, I cover all of those in the book. Uh, yeah, you can put your stuff out there, but it's going to be really hard to get anybody to pay you for it because that same internet has driven the price of digital content to zero. I, I, I'd been thinking about that for a long time before I set out to write the book. I wrote the book because those two stories left me with a question. I mean, I basically believe the artists. I trust them more, and I think they're in a better position to know, and it, their story makes sense to me. But people are still making art. Some of them are even still making a living making art or at least making a partial living making art. So the question the book addresses is, how are they doing it? Not as a rhetorical question, but an actual question. How are they doing it? Um, the answer is the book or, I, or most of the book. I'll explain that in a, in a couple of minutes. And mostly I set about answering the question in addition to reading a lot and so forth mainly by interviewing artists and people in the arts. The book is based on about 140 lengthy interviews with you know, editors and publishers and other experts, academics, but mainly with artists. Just ask them to tell me about their lives. So I start with the broad conditions that shape this question now. It's the internet and digital demonetization, but it's not only that, it's also the the way housing costs have risen in the last 20 years, uh, the way tuition costs have risen in the last 20 years or more, the decline of cultural institutions that help artists make a living, whether those are for-profit like labels and publishers or non-profit like museums and universities is, is an important issue. Um, basically, what I say in this part of the book is that there's good news, I'm sorry, there's bad news, everything pays much less. There's good news. There really are tons of new opportunities enabled by the internet, and you really can just do it all yourself. And then there's bad news about the good news. There are tons of new opportunities and millions of people pursuing them because everyone else has heard the same pitch that you have. You can do it yourself, but you also have to. So. That's what you might call the macroeconomics. Then I turn to the microeconomics, which is just the nuts and bolts of doing it yourself, of being, as one painter put it to me, a one-man band, a single person, small business, self-production, self-management, self-marketing, crowdfunding, the whole thing. Then I drill down even more because I wanna give a really precise, really detailed, really granular picture of what's going on. So I have one chapter on each of the four main arts that I talk about, music, writing, visual art, and film and television. And within each of those chapters, drilling down even further, I have profiles of half a dozen artists or artistic partnerships. And I'm gonna read one of those in a minute at Tammy's very good suggestion that I include that to give you a really specific sense. I should say, I'm, I'm very grateful for Nathaniel Rich's blurb about you know begging artists. Um, the book is not quite as negative as that blurb makes it sound. I mean, there really is some good news here and some people who I profile who have been successful and I want, I want to give a rounded picture. I, I, it's, not, it's not an agenda. The agenda is to get as clear a picture as I could. Uh, I said before that that's most of the book. I also have a section where I talk about how I think the new circumstances are changing both art and the role of artists in society in society. Basically, what happens to art and to the role of artists in society, the way we see artists, when artists are now fully immersed in the market in the way that they've never really been had before, have, have, had, have, have been before, mainly because, you know, the mediating institutions are falling down. 
And I conclude with a section about what needs to be done. Uh, there's a section on art schools and what needs to be done there, a chapter on piracy and copyright and the evil doings of big tech, because as the subtitle suggests, that's a big part of this. And finally, a chapter on the way that artists are organizing to fight back and on the larger reforms that I think are necessary. So to give a more precise sense of the texture of the book, I'm going to read one of these miniature profiles. Nicole Deeker is pretty much the ideal person to have tried to self-publish a work of literary fiction. Deeker grew up in, a, in small town, Missouri, the older of two daughters of a piano teacher and a music professor. Her upbringing taught her to value the, uh, to value the arts, but above all, she told me, it taught her to practice. Quote, the idea that every day you're gonna sit down at your instrument and you're gonna try to get better at it that taught me as much about how to be an artist as the art itself. In college and after college, she tried to make it as a musician and, and in theater, especially as a musician. And she, before realizing that she didn't actually have the talent for an actual career, talent is a whole issue we could talk about. Um, one day to earn some extra money, she started writing for Crowdsource, which she called one of those content flight sites that people slag on because they pay so badly. She was taking micro gigs, like writing recipes for food.com for $5 a piece. But she turned out to be really good at it and more important, really fast. Writing was the first thing where people kept asking me for more, she said. So she started pitching other sites and hustling for other gigs and tracking her income to make sure she was earning more each week. And five years later, she said, now I'm here here being a flourishing freelance career, writing for a whole range of websites. In 2013, her first year of full-time writing, she made $40,000. And by 2016, she was up to twice that. Speed was still her secret weapon, along with meticulous organization and a musician's sense of discipline. In that year of 2016, and I still find this unbelievable, especially as a writer. She accepted more than 700 assignments for an average of about $125 a piece. That's how she got to about $80,000. And she published over half a million words. My book is not a short book. Half a million words is four times the length of my book. And meanwhile, she was working on a novel a fictionalized version of her own family story, as she explained to me, kind of a little women for millennials. She actually added a third daughter. Uh, she wrote it as a series of discrete vignettes, about three to five pages each, both because she was used to composing at that kind of length, 700 times a year, and because she had to fit the writing in around her other work, writing half a million words. Uh, so I asked her how she managed that, and she said, I practiced just like she learned to do when she was a, a young musician. The result, The Biographies of Ordinary People in two volumes, is a lovely, unpretentious story suffused with feeling that unfolds at the speed of life. When she was re ready, she queried agents, you know, the typical kind of old model culture industry thing to do, and all of the agents who she queried said that the book was not sufficiently commercial for a mainstream press, not an atypical response. Uh, one of them said you could publish it some other way as, quote, an art book. Deeker told me she thought, you just said I made art. That's all I ever wanted. Although it wasn't quite all she wanted because she also wanted to publish it, which meant she decided to publish it herself. And as she got the venture going, because she is such a um, prolific blogger, she started a blog called This Week in Self-Publishing to document the process. This blog, when I went and read it uh, after a lot of it, a couple of years of it had been written, reads in retrospect like a novel about putting out a novel, complete with plot twists and dramatic ironies and a passage from innocence to experience. So the story starts four months before volume one is released. She says that she hopes to sell 5,000 copies, which is a lot even for a commercial author, let alone a debut author including three to 500 before pub, pub day. She's already done a ton of groundwork as her self-publishing platform, and there are well over a dozen. She's chosen one called Pronoun, 
She loves pronoun. It's enabled her to do comparative cover research, Amazon category research, price research. These are all the same things that you need to think about. It's going to provide her with advanced reading copies, which what you send to reviewers. It's given her a great looking order site. Her only worry is that if the platform ha goes under, she'll lose the novel's ISBN number, is the term, which is its unique commercial product code. If you look in the back of any book, you'll see the ISBN number, which will mean she'll lose all her sales data and metrics. Over the next few months, we watch her send the book out for reviews, place articles about it, tap her freelance network for marketing leads, do podcasts, plan a tour, defend herself to the readers of the blog for sounding calculating and strategic, for thinking about money, in other words, and reminds us that although she wrote the book from love, she can't, quote, just fling words into the sky without any dream of long-term financial stability. A month and a half before the launch, she loses all of her pre-orders, or the ones she's received through Amazon, which are most of her pre-orders, because of a glitch in pronoun software. By pub day, she sold 109 copies. Remember, she wanted three to 500. But she puts a brave face on it. Readers are responding well. She's gotten a couple of lovely Amazon reviews. The launch event went great. And she can actually hold a copy of her very own novel. In fact, she posts a picture of it on her shelf in between Alison Bechtel and Jane Smiley. It's everything a debut author could want, she says. And then she presses on. She applies for awards. She pitches to reviewers and bloggers. She does promos and discounts and giveaways. There's something poignant about the way that she can sometimes straddle the line between real authorhood and newbie self-delusion. One of the awards that she submits the novel for is the Pulitzer. She's excited to discover that you can, in fact, just send your book to Fresh Air or the New York Times, as she puts it. She hears from the New York Review of Books. They want to know if she wants to buy an ad. Gradually, it sinks in that the novel will not be the success that she'd hoped for. A month and a half after launch, she adjusts her sales target down from 3,000 to 500, forgetting that it had originally been 5,000. Ten months later, having started the entire process with an advance, as she calls it, of $6,900 that she collected over Patreon, the crowdfunding site, she tells us that she's now about $1,000 in the red because actual book sales have only brought in $1,600. Meanwhile, Pronoun has in fact folded, taking her sales data and metrics with it. She has to move the book to Kindle Direct Publishing, which is a platform owned by Amazon. She also learns that Goodreads, which is also owned by Amazon, will start charging writers for giveaways, which are a key marketing tool for independent authors. She's discovered, she tells us, that self-publishing does not really give you the kind of control she'd thought because you're always at the mercy of the platform. In the midst of it all, she writes a long, tormented post about the sacrifices she's making for the novel. She's already told us that she's devoted every, nearly every free minute on it for three years, those sacrifices including being less available to family and friends. But the truth is that I want it more than anything, she writes. I have structured my entire life to have this choice. My job is to be good enough to get to keep making this choice for as long as I can. Um, just, to, just to pull out some themes from that story that recur throughout the book. First of all, there's Amazon, there's the tech platforms, and what it really means to, you know, to, be, to do it yourself means that you have to be, you're, you're at the mercy of them to, to a great extent. Second, the incredibly hard work she puts in. The possibilities the new technology creates, the high hopes those possibilities often give rise to, the difficult realities those hopes often meet, and finally, the incredible perseverance with which those difficulties are met. I, we have these conceptions of, of what, you know, what artists are like in our society, like they're these kind of like indolent dreamers that making art is like a leisure activity for weirdos. Uh, the, the, the truth could not be more diametrically opposed to that. I mean, I wanna say that I wrote this book 
from a place of gratitude for what artists give us, for what art has given me, um, and of empathy for what they go through. I mean, I don't want to be maudlin about it, but to a certain extent, it, it's a love letter to artists. Certainly a thank you letter written with love. The empathy only deepened as I conducted the interviews, but what I also got from those interviews was a tremendous sense of admiration. I mean, really in a way that I never had before, like what are artists really like? They're really tough, they're really resourceful, they're really tenacious, they're really courageous. They're also really optimistic and generous. So I wanna say I didn't write this book to discourage anyone. I did write it to give people a reality check. I wanted younger artists in particular to understand what they're up against. And I wanted all artists to understand that they're not alone. And then there's the rest of us, there's the audience. For us, I wanted it to be a wake up call. So I'm gonna end with a couple of short passages from the introduction that I think brings this into focus. So the first one, how much time do you spend during an average day consuming art? Not just visual art, art, not just high art, art, but all art. Narratives in books, narratives on television, jazz on the stereo, songs in your earphones, paintings, sculptures, photographs, concerts, ballet, movies, poetry, plays, probably several, time, several hours a day. Given the way that people listen to music at this point, possibly every waking minute. That's the stakes. That's how important art is in our lives and therefore how important artists are in our lives. So here's the second passage. If most of us are oblivious to the plight of artists now, there's an obvious reason for that. Not only is there still a lot of art being made, there is much, much more of it at a lower cost than ever. For us, the consumers of art, there really hasn't ever been a better time. At least, not if you equate quantity with quality or do not worry over much about the workers at the other end of the supply chain. First, we had fast food. Then we had fast fashion. Now we have fast art, fast music, fast writing, fast video, photography, design, and illustration made cheaply and consumed in haste. We can gorge ourselves to our heart's content. How nourishing those products are and how sustainable the systems that create them are questions that we need to ask ourselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Tammy. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate your reading and I think the, the profile and the excerpt that you just read just um, really humanize what's going on for artists and for the rest of us. Um, I just wanted to say um, that you guys should all buy Bill's excellent, amazing book. There's a link in the chat. Um, I, Bill is an old friend of mine, but we became friends sort of by talking about some of these issues, about talking about um, you know, what's happening in our economy and how it affects creative people. Um, Bill, I wanted to start with a note about process. You mentioned that you interviewed 140 people, and I know that's just the artists you then interviewed and read. No, no, it's, it's everybody. Is that it's everybody? everybody okay. but most of them are artists. Most yeah. of them are artists. Okay. Um, and so I was curious about if you could talk, describe, you know, how you found those people um, and, you know, kind of what the process uh, was like, you know, extracting from them their stories and then sort of trying to organize those and systematize lessons from their stories. Yeah. That was the hard, that was probably the hardest part of the book was getting to people who I wanted to interview because if, if, you, if you're an artist who I would have heard of or I could find easily, I didn't want to talk to you because I didn't want to talk to people who were famous. I should say also most of the people I talked to were younger. They were between 25 and 40 uh, by design because I want, they're going to really know that, you know, they haven't made it. They didn't come up in the old system. They really know what the new system is like. It was really hard to find those people. So. I started partly with personal contacts. I turned to you, you gave me a list of about 20 people, which was wonderful, and I contacted a number of them. And I reached out, I live in Portland, Portland, Oregon, so I reached out to people I knew here, um, old students, a few people I cold called, um, and I worked my way from one person to another. And the reason I need to do that is because, you know, these emails I were sending said, you don't know me, I want to talk to you for at least an hour and I want you to tell me the intimate details of your financial life for this book I'm writing, which you're not supposed to ask people. Um, and some people said no, but you know what? I mean, and so therefore I needed people who had a reason to trust me, which means somebody else would vouch for me, usually somebody I had just interviewed. Um, so um, I forgot my train of thought. Oh yeah, I mean, it was, um, right. Some people said no. Most people said yes. 
the interviews were really, they were really moving. I mean, I, first of all, I just love to have deep one-on-one -on -one conversations with people, but um, I did them over the phone. I didn't do them by video or in person because I thought people would like, kind of forget that I was there and just be more candid. And, and I was right. And, and um, anyway, so you asked me about after that, I ended up with 1300 pages of notes collected over about two years. And it took me literally eight months to organize the notes before I even started writing. Um, it's, it was a big job, ultimately a very gratifying job. Wow, thank you. Um, and I know that you conducted those interviews and obviously the book went to press before the pandemic, but as I was reading, it just, you know, it, it all just seems so much more true. Every, every word really is just more emphatically so now. And I feel like every day I'm having conversations with filmmaking friends and artist friends about, are there going to be galleries? You know, what economy are we going to show our films in? Um, I'm curious if you want to say just a little bit about, you know, your reflections during this period and whether you, maybe you've checked in with a couple of those artists or just sort of general thoughts on yes, yes. the market. Yeah, I did. I, 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 I wrote to everybody to ask me, all 140 people uh, a few months ago. I ended up talking to about 20 of them or getting long emails from 20 of them. I don't have anything specific to say from those except like, it's exactly what you would think. You know, like one person had five shows canceled. Um, one musician told me that a friend of hers had sent out a mass email where he just went into his touring van and broke into tears. Because just briefly, like, so digital content has been demonetized. So as I talk very extensively about in the book, you have to find alternatives. And the two main kinds of alternatives are selling physical things, like physical books or whatever, or live experiences and most of those experiences are in, were in-person experiences and certainly in-person experiences pay better so the most obvious thing is that musicians you've probably heard this for years have to tour 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 till you drop you can't tour anymore um there are other aspects to it as well i mean even just the day jobs you know driving for uber and lyft uh waiting tables pulling shots uh tending bar i mean a million different things but the one thing I want to say, and I, and I know you're you you know you know you're going to want to underscore is not just what's happening now, but you know after the plague years in the aftertime, what's it going to look like then? And uh, unfortunately, as it seems to be the case throughout the economy, there's going to be a huge consolidation in favor of the largest players. I just I don't know if you saw the piece in the Times yesterday about live streaming concerts. You know, and people try, it was about trying to make them pay, but there was one unbelievable statistic that 90% um, of indie music venues, 90% of people who run indie music venues think that they won't survive into next year. So it's gonna be Amazon, Facebook, Live Nation, the big publishers, the big uh, music labels, it's gonna be terrible. <laughs> Unless we do something, God knows what that something's gonna be. Yeah, I definitely want to talk a little bit about kind of responses or solutions in a minute. Um, I had a couple of things before that. I was really grateful for the book's discussion about geography and housing, which is something you alluded to in your introductory comments. But we're obviously in the midst of a housing crisis that was already extreme and is much more extreme now. Um, but this plays into your book in the discussion of centers. Um, you, you ask the question of whether artists really need to live in centers, meaning these sort of metropolises that are extremely expensive, but have kind of been the historic centers of certain kinds of production. Can you talk about that? You know, how important is that for a writer, for instance, to live in New York or a musician in Nashville and Los Angeles and what you found through the, the research process? Right, right. And you helped me think through this when I, inter when I interviewed you. You're one of the 140 interviews. Um, this was one of the few questions that I made a point of asking just everybody I could. Do you think that an artist has to be in a center? Or as the tech industry story goes, um, you can be anywhere because of the internet. And what I found with amazing consistency, not universally, but a great deal of consistency, is that the answer is, no, you can't just be anywhere. You certainly can't just be anywhere when you're establishing yourself. Once you've established yourself, which can take 10, 15, 20 years, yeah, then you can move wherever you want. So you have to move to a center. Uh, everything is consolidating. You pointed out in our interview, the culture industries themselves are consolidating. Uh, in most art, I mean, music is, is probably the biggest exception, but in most arts, a center means New York or LA or maybe Chicago. Really expensive cities. 
I did not speak to a single person who was living in a major center um, and paying a market rent for a decent apartment on what they made as an artist. So either they were not living decently, had gotten lucky because they had connections, or had family money, which is a big, so it's a huge, huge issue. Eight years ago, you, you wrote a really great op-ed in the New York Times that asked about food, about um, how food came to replace art as high culture. And uh, that, that recipe at that time really resonated with me. I've thought about it a lot since. And now reading your book, I see that as maybe one of the kind of stepping stones into this argument that you've made in the book, which is about artists as producers. This is the term that, that you come up with to kind of summarize what's happening. Um, and, and I noticed that there was also a a critique in the book about how as consumers of art, we're, we're more likely to pay for expensive food than costly art, you know, so there's something about kind of food in the culture that that I thought was a sort of interesting adjacent argument to, to some of what you're discussing in the arts. Can you talk about that in, in the sure. sort of economy now? Yeah, I tried to shoehorn that into the book, but I just felt like the book was long enough, but it would have been in that long chapter where I kind of try to take the measure culturally of what's been going on. By the way, you know, for all the things that I've written that piss people off, I think word for word, I never wrote anything that generated more anger and resentment than that argument, that food is not art. I mean, I, like, which is amazing because I think 40 years ago or 20 years ago, nobody would have thought that food is an art form. So in the, in the book, although the, I don't talk about food in, in in particular, but where it would have fit in the book was in that chapter where I say that there's this new thing called creativity. It's a new thing because the, the idea has been redefined as a business concept or an economic concept. That creativity means something creative that you can sell. So it's actually, you know, it, it itself embodies the fact that art, you know, and once you start talking about creativity, then anything creative, and certainly many things are creative that aren't art, but art ends up getting submerged into this larger category of creativity as if it were just another thing. It's just like food. It's just like writing code. It's just like any of the cr things that creative people do, that the creative class does. And I think it's one of the things that contributes to the devaluing of art and the devaluing of artists and the further sort of equating of art with that something that's in the market. So just to pick up on that a bit more, so I yeah. mentioned that you use the term producers, you know, to define yeah, yeah, yeah. what is sort of a fourth era of, of art yes. or the yes. defining of art. Can you just say for the audience kind of what those right, four right. eras of yes. art are? Yeah, this is the sort of, this is the big think. This is yeah, the, right. the big sort of intellectual, cultural criticism, cut, yeah. cultural <laughs> history, right, section of the book. Um, in some ways, uh, it, in some ways, this is the starting point for the book, because I had to start thinking about people. Somebody wanted me to give a talk about creative entrepreneurs. That was the buzzword, right? Creative, it's still the buzz term, creative entrepreneur. And I thought, like, how did we get from, like, the genius solitary artist to creative entrepreneur? And that made me realize, no, actually, it's much more complicated. So in the Renaissance and earlier, artists were considered artisans. The two words meant the same thing. Our entire sort of ideological philosophical apparatus around art did not exist. That comes into being with modernity, with ideas of uh, freedom of thought and democracy and, and uh, overthrowing tradition and authority and articulating new truths. It also comes into being with capitalism. People don't like to hear this. Art with a capital A, which is what I'm talking about, phase two, was made possible by capitalism. It also pitches itself against capitalism. How do you do that? Well, you kind of stay on the margins of the market. You uh, enter in as little as possible and you live kind of a socially and economically countercultural existence. And if you do that, we call you a bohemian, which is a word that comes from exactly this time. It's a 19th century word. Phase one, artisan. Phase two, bohemian. We didn't go straight from the bohemian to the creative entrepreneur. Uh, after World War II, and this is something people in the arts don't like to talk about, basically art became a profession and this enormous professional apparatus, I think the most obvious uh, element of it is the MFA program. The MFA was invented in the 20s. As of the end of World War II, I think there were 11 schools giving uh, graduate degrees in visual art in the United States. 
11, and then by 1980, it was like 150. And okay, so um, there was something actually really good about that though, because now the starving artist, if you, if you were successful, not blockbuster successful, but just like you work full time, um, people like your work, your peers, critics, audience, you could have a middle class standard of life. You could live uh, decent housing, decent health care, send your kids to college. This is now giving way to what I call the fourth paradigm, which I call the producer. Because, because exactly, because it's an economic concept. It's just like, it's cultural production. Like art is not this special thing. It's just another form of production. And being a producer, are you an entrepreneur? Not really, because you're not actually building a business. You're just self-employed, very different thing. And you're not really a worker. Sometimes you are because you take gig, gigs, but you're some other, this other entity that more and more people are. It's not just artists that are producers. This is like the new condition. We're all particles in the marketplace just trying to survive. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if you, uh, we could talk a little bit about the international dimension to this. Um, your book is primarily focused on, you know, interviews with people in the U.S., but the corporations and the economic structures that you des describe are transnational. Um, is, it your, is it your feeling that the conditions you describe for artists are universal and global, or are there mitigating factors such as, you know, working social welfare states or <laughs> government investment um, right. in other countries that make this uh, a more feasible prospect to make art. Right, I mean, simply because this was such a big project to wrap my arms around, I confined it to the United States. Um, I think it's broadly, look, the internet is everywhere. I think it's broadly the case everywhere. I think you're right that in Europe, they have better social safety net and I didn't learn this. This is like the last thing I learned in writing the book. I knew that they fund the arts more in Europe. It's 60 times more, six zero, as a percentage of GDP public funding is 60 times more. That makes a difference. But yes, I think this is everywhere. I actually months ago already had translation deals with China and Russia, which surprised me. But um, yeah, with, you know, yes, with local conditions, mo making modifications, I think this is basically everywhere. One last question for me before we turn to the audience. In the conclusion section of the book, you, you would talk about responses. Um, and one of the efforts you highlight in the chapter called Don't Mourn, Organize, great title, um, is WAGE, W-A-G-E, Working Artists in the Greater Economy. Um, I've been fascinated by their work since Occupy Wall Street when some of these conversations among artists really started going. Um, can you explain what they do and, and um, you know, how successful their sure. efforts have been? Well, the interesting thing about WAGE is that, and it's, so it's, it's a movement, it's an organization that in the visual art world, in the so-called art world, they have had a certain amount of success because they, um, they've gotten very, very specific about what they're working on. Basically, they, they attack the following problem. Uh, our, uh, organizations, institutions that show the work that artists do, don't pay them. Uh, it's not just that they show the work that artists, okay, so museums, art spaces, uh, universities, mainly museums and art spaces. It's not just that they show artists' work, they also get a lot of educational programming from artists, that's the real thing. Workshops, talks, show your film. Uh, the pay is either not existent or very haphazard, and that's typical, you know, free, free labor demanded from artists. So Wage said, that's the issue we're gonna attack. We're gonna gather a lot of data, we're gonna ask the artists what they get from various institutions, and then we're gonna create a certifying program that says, here museum or art space is what you need to pay artists for the following 20 different categories of things. And it's prorated based on the size of the institution. Um, they're not asking the Met to pay the same thing as a small art space. And then, and then if you agree to do this and can show us that you're doing this, that you're paying artists fairly, that you're paying artists equally, then we will certify you. It's like you know a green certified building or something. Um, I don't know the exact number, but they've gotten I don't know dozens or scores of of institutions to sign up. Very few actual museums. They tend to be smaller spaces, but they're slowly making progress. And just quickly, they're also saying to artists, 
you employ people too. You employ studio assistants who make nothing. I mean, sometimes as little as $11 an hour in New York City. We have a certification program for you guys now, and we want you to be responsible. You know, we're, we're not just work, looking out for artists, we're looking for, out for all of the workers in this sector of ours. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I do have a couple really good questions in the chat, but first I wanted to ask one of my own uh, related to something you said earlier about um, market rent in these cultural centers. Was it ever the case in America that the majority of the creative class were living in cultural centers like New York and LA and Chicago and paying rent commensurate with their artistic earnings? And if that was the case, is there anything that we can learn from, from the past, from w what that was like? I'm so glad you asked me that because I think people assume that the gentrification cycle has been going on forever. It only started in the 80s. Um, so I point out that, you know, Greenwich Village was the bohemia, at least in New York. I mean, in, uh, from the beginning of the 20th century through the 70s, right? Eugene O'Neill was there, Bob Dylan was there. Same thing with the bohemias in San Francisco, in London. Um, basically, until about 1950, the industrial cities were expanding, 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 growing, growing, growing. So there was room for everybody. Then deindustrialization happened, so the cities emptied out. That's also where also the, all the loft spaces came from. New York lost like literally half a million manufacturing jobs in like 20 or 30 years after the war. I mean, rents were incredibly cheap, not just rent, but also costs of like performance spaces, rehearsal spaces in New York City. Mm. And then, and then sort of 80s era gentrification and then 21st century gentrification and what, do, okay, now though, what do you do about it? <laughs> I mean, their initiatives, you know, the Artist Studio Affordability Project, um, Artist Subsidized Housing, they're so tiny compared to the scale of the problem. Honestly, I don't even address the question of what we can do about that particular issue in the book because I don't want to spin scenarios, um, you know? Uh, let, me, let me just say, I mean, uh, 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 Tammy referenced that last chapter. What I really say is here are a bunch of things artists are doing, and it's great that they're doing it, and they're making a little bit of progress, or maybe more than a little bit. What we really need to do is solve the whole economy, is make a more equitable economy. It's not just the arts economy. If we're going to make the arts economy more livable, we have to make the whole economy more livable. That's what we need to do. Can you think of any particular advocates in the public sphere that you sort of look at, I know, <laughs> that you see and, and um, are inspired by in terms of sort of uh, being advocates for these kinds of programs? Are there any figures, public figures, who you think are good examples to, to watch? For the kinds, of, for specific, art-specific programs? Right, right. Um, listen, there are people in each art field that have really taken on some of these issues. There's a filmmaker named Ellen Seidler who's really spearheaded the uh, piracy issue. And she works with a big organization called Creative Future. That's a big alliance uh, that started in film and TV and now uh, is across the arts. Um, in, in, the, in the visual art world, Wage and Occupy Museums and places like that. Um, um, music, David Lowry uh, and Roseanne Cash. There's a group called the Artist Rights Alliance that's really trying to. Um, but I mean, I don't think any of these people uh, as advocates have a lot of visibility in the culture in general. And I think quite frankly that this issue doesn't have a lot of visibility in the culture in general. And I'm afraid it's because I think people don't care that much. Mm -hmm. I mean, People love their free or low cost art and they don't really want to think about the human cost. They don't want to think about the fact that we couldn't, we've been fooling ourselves by thinking that we can get something for nothing without any social cost. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I do have a couple questions in the chat and people can feel free to submit more. Um, Christopher asks, it sounds like the archive you developed in preparing the book might be something valuable in the sense of studs, turkels, working, so like an oral history. Do you have any plans for those records? Do you keep them neat? Are they presentable? 
You know, it, it's funny. I realized that maybe if I were uh, younger and it started a few years later, this would have been a podcast and not a book. <laughs> I, I recorded all the interviews, but I conducted those interviews with the understanding that I would only be using them for this, and I certainly wouldn't be broadcasting them. Um, maybe a lot of the people I interviewed would be okay with that. Um, it's an interesting question. Also, the interviews were not, you know, they're not like tight podcast interviews. So. Um, <laughs> It's, I, I've never thought about it, and I might actually start thinking about it now. Another question from the chat. I know that terms like grit and resilience have come to characterize success in a world marked by inequality. Did you find that these words described some or all of the artists you interviewed, or are despair or hustle or pragmatism or something else closer to the mark? I would just say, did you say despair? Despair. I would, I would say other than despair, <laughs> all, of those, all of those words are appropriate. I mean, I have, I, I devote a couple of pages to this because I really wanted to say it. Like, here's what we think artists are like. Here's what they're really like. And I mean, seriously, I, I'd known some art. I mean, I know some artists personally, but I'd never really gotten into it so much so that I saw I mean, I, I was serious what I said before. These people are amazing. They're amazing just because they've persevered and they've persevered because they have so much grit and so much hustle. I mean, they work all the time. Most of them live very cheaply and simply of necessity. They're willing to do without. I mean, let's put it this way. I think a lot of us dream when we're younger of being an artist of some kind or other. And most of us are filtered out. Most of us drop out. And the ones that that survive even to age 30, they're of necessity very special people. I have another question from the chat. Uh, what was the most surprising thing you learned from the hundreds of conversations that you had? What was the most sort of baffling or surprising thing? Okay, so here's the thing. And I, I, it may not be exactly what the uh, question is asking. I think the best answer to that question is the last answer. Like, I really got, it wasn't surprising, but I really got this much fuller sense of it. I started this book from that position of art and money must never touch. Art is pure. Art is sullied by contact with money, by contact with the market. If you think about money as an artist, you're a sellout. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with these kids now that they're licensing their songs for commercials? And fairly early in the process, mainly because I had a, a really intense interview with one artist um, who insisted on being anonymous because it was a really intense interview. And they said to me like, because I had written an, an essay that said that basically, or was written from that position. He said, you know, this is complete bullshit. You've bought into this myth just like anybody else. And it completely spun my head around. And I've, it's not, my attitude has changed, but my attitude changed because I uh, allowed myself to recognize realities that I already knew but wouldn't accept, which is that, of course, art and money are intimately connected in a society where, you know, money is intimately connected with everything. Uh, so that, that was the big revelation, and I ended up in a very different place that I started. Another question from the chat is about your process. Um, simply, when do you get your best writing done? And what's, uh, what are your most effective means of sort of synthesizing the, the amount of information you had to take in from these conversations and also the other research that you were doing for the book? Right. Um, I write in the morning and early afternoon. I stop writing when my energy suddenly plummets and I realize it's time to stop. On a good day, I can get in maybe six hours. Um, and um, yeah, so I said I spent eight months organizing the notes. I think a big rule for me has always been, don't rush. You know, take as, it takes as long as it takes. Do today what you can do today and tomorrow you'll do more. And just, I, I, I had a deadline that I overshot by about six months. The publisher was fine with it. And I mean, if someone's looking for advice, that's what I would say. Like, it takes as long as it takes. And, you know, doing eight months of organization 
meant that I could write the book in about a year, and it's a long book. Uh, that that groundwork will you know you'll get that time back if you really do the work. Mm -hmm. Don't take any shortcuts. Do you have readers? Do you share your works in progress? I think Adele Waldman has blurbed maybe all of your books, and um, the love affairs of Nathaniel P is such an incredible novel. It's one of my favorite books to hand sell. Um, oh, good, 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 good. I wonder if you, uh, not her specifically, but do you have readers who you, you give your, your works in progress to and whose opinions you, you trust? I don't. Uh, it's not because I don't trust anybody's opinions, but um, I don't know if this is just the way I am. I'm kind of an introvert. I, I, I um, no, yeah. no, because I mean, like, I know what I'm going for and I think, yeah, you know, I mean, I had a, I had, I've, I've had a, a, a good working relationship with my editor, Barbara Jones at Holt. She, she's, and, and yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Another question from the chat. I really enjoyed your last book about elite education, Excellent Sheep. Uh, which I'll post the link to buy in the chat very shortly. Are there specific parts of this book that you think build on to parts from that book? So I tie this book to Excellent Sheep right at the beginning and right at the end. In, 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 many, in most ways, they're different. They're similar in that they're both about what this economy is doing, especially to young people, how you know, how it's affected their lives, whether it's going to college or making art. Um, and sort of more broadly, what does education and the arts have in common? They're both, you know, to use maybe a sentimental word, they're both about the spirit. So what's happening to the spirit under the regime of this economy? What room is there left for the spirit? And then at the very end of the book, I say, you know what, I've ended up in exactly the same place as I ended up in the last book, which is I talked about this one particular problem, but if we're really gonna solve it, we need, listen, I hear that there are people in the streets now who are demanding that we solve these problems. Finally, maybe we will actually make some progress. I mean, whether it's people assuming tens of thousands of dollars of debt for tuition and, 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 and how that shapes their college experience, or this thing that we've been talking about. Another good question from the chat. What would you recommend to leaders of academic institutions who cultivate MFAs? <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Again, first of all, this is something I never thought I would have said when I started the book. Um, I don't want MFA school to turn into trade school, but if you're not helping your graduates figure out a way to make a living from their art, you're doing them an enormous disservice. The fact is that in many ways, MFA schools are turning into trade schools because there's less and less emphasis on the, the traditional disciplines that are not just traditional, but they're the ones that train the eye and the hand and the mind. And in an attempt to find customers more and more trendy sort of internet forward uh, kinds of MFAs. I don't wanna go on about this too long, but all of the pathologies of contemporary American higher education um, are are to be found in art schools and in some ways they're more urgent there because the typical art school graduate does not have a lot of earning potential mm -hmm. uh, related question is the sheer number of art schools in the united states who are giving out mfas excessive since most of the mfas have to turn to teaching to support themselves so now the market is hungry for self-taught artists I don't know if the market is hungry for self-taught artists that I've heard, but I absolutely agree. I'm glad for this follow-up question. Yes, I think the MFA system has been wildly overbuilt. There are far too many MFA programs and graduates. Uh, at the same time, enrollment started to plummet after 2008, which means that except for the most prestigious programs, acceptance rates, acceptance rates are very high in MFA programs, which means they're admitting a lot of people they shouldn't admit just to take their money, um, and who, who quite frankly should not, should be doing something else with their lives. But no one's going to tell them that. It's it's uh, the artist who talked to me about this, who I quote in the book. She said, "Give me an hour to scream," because she's taught in a lot of art schools and she sees what it, you know, yeah. And I think 
this might be the last question, unless anybody has anything else they'd like to throw in the chat, but would a favorable Supreme Court ruling in a class action copyright suit against, for example, YouTube, produce the attention to this issue that you say is needed? Why have we resigned ourselves to impotent self-loathing? Silicon Valley is as much a legal innovation as it is a technological one. So why not fight them more aggressively? So it's a couple questions. I couldn't agree with this more. I talk about this in the book in that last chapter. Um, the thing about free content, demonetized content, is that it's incredibly lucrative. Um, I quote a different author who said that by 2015, he estimates that $50 billion every year of revenue has been shifted from creators to the platform. It hasn't disappeared, it's still there, it's just going to the platform. So what do we do about this? We need to reform copyright law, absolutely, but mainly we need to use antitrust law. We need to break up big tech. I mean, that's yet another reason that we need to do this because their ability to screw artists is all about their market power. I did just get another question. You mentioned the role of family money. Uh, can you comment on the class divide among artists and the role that it plays among them? Oh, yeah. This is sort of one of the big dirty secrets in the arts, maybe in other fields. Um, and there are even statistics. It's not just, I mean, every anecdotal, every person you talk to will tell you that, yes, it's mostly rich kids, many rich kids, architecture, filmmaking, visual art, whatever. But there are also statistics about it. Artists come uh, from... I think they have the most affluent family backgrounds or the second most out of like 30 occupational groups. Um, if we care about, I also wanna say, if we care about diversity, we have to care about economics. The less money there is in the arts for artists, the more, even more it becomes a rich kid's game. And in this country and in many countries, you know, that's, rel that's related to your race, to your ethnicity, even to your gender. So yeah, it's the big secret. I have another question. Uh, aside from supporting your local bookstore, like McNally Jackson, for instance, <laughs> uh, what are some good ways that consumers can support artists? Yeah. Um, listen, this is just going to sound obvious. You know the answer to this person who asked and so does everybody else pay for stuff hey that's especially hard to ask people to do now and even before the pandemic but that's the truth um a number of people i talked to have talked about kind of a consumer movement like a like a like the food movement where we try to you know organic food that's grown that's humane not just for animals but for the workers who are involved in its production um that would be uh, that would be one way to help. I'm skeptical that it's actually going to happen because, first of all, with food you're getting a better product, and second of all, with food you can virtue signal because you strut into Whole Foods with your head held high or your farmer's market. With art, it's not like people really know. But if that's you know if that's you don't have to think up of a way. The way is right in front of us. The way is to buy the things that people don't always buy anymore. Well. I think that's all the time we have for tonight. But speaking of buying things, there is another link in the chat to buy this wonderful book from us. Uh, you can have it shipped to your home, or if you're, you're in New York City, you can uh, choose to pick it up from one of our four locations. I'm not open here at City Point, but I can walk it out to you if you'd like to come see me. Uh, we can meet in front of Target. Um, but this has been a lot of fun. Thank you, Bill. Good. Thank, Thank you, you Tammy. So much. For leading Thank the you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you guys. Congratulations, Thanks, Bill. everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye, Have a wonderful everybody. night, everybody. Thank you very much. And congratulations, Bye. Bill. Thanks. Yay! <laughs> <laughs>